death and destruction, the product of war. Just as human life is never expendable, so must property and the machines and equipment of war be saved and reclaimed at the earliest possible moment. It's done at a base salvage depot, a huge area covering many acres and divided into different sections to handle every type of salvageable article. From Shermans to shoes, from rifles to radios, from 155s to W110B field wire. It's all brought here by mop-up crews of quartermaster salvage companies. They follow on the heels of the booby trap experts and scour the countryside in the wake of the battle, picking up their cargo of planes, gasoline cans, tanks, shoes and canteens, parts of railroad cars, small arms, and clothing. There's no discrimination shown here. They gather both enemy and allied equipment, no matter how battered or muddy or rusty. It's all brought back to the depot for sorting, and it's there that it's decided what reclamation is necessary. Every ounce or thread of usable material is broken down to its most basic stage and reprocessed for its most valuable use. No country in the world can carry on a war by using only new equipment. Supply and demand won't permit it. So we must conserve our wool, our rubber, our steel, and reuse them as often as possible. As the salvage crews check in, they're directed to the section where they're to dump their loads, to signal repair, to ordnance, to whatever branch the equipment may belong, each of which has its own designated section. Every effort is made to keep the same types of material together and to maintain order even in a dump heap. This depot covers a particularly large area, and a big part of it is assigned to heavy material, such as trucks and tanks. In the textile repair section, they first concentrate on sorting the clothing. Some of the stuff is good only for rags, but rags are good to clean guns. Shirts may be pretty well torn, but a new sleeve or a set of buttons makes a usable garment. In any case, everything is thoroughly cleaned or washed before it is repaired. This stage is covered by native workers who are paid for their strength, their time and their skill to turn out a piece of clothing that is as good as new. Tents, too, are classified, inspected, and sorted before they're cleaned and repaired. We got plenty of schooling on this in the African campaign from Omar the tent maker, so we put it to good use here. A small patch, a whole new side, or just a rainproofing job, will remake an old piece of canvas into a first-class shelter. In a mobile repair shop built into a truck designed for the signal corps, an SCR-536, better known as a handy talkie, is to be stripped down and rebuilt if possible. The T-4 is rebuilding an SCR-608, testing each tube and rewiring each connection. From this BD-72, some of the parts will be reused in its rebuilding but others will be thrown on a community scrap pile to be sorted and melted down with metal from other sources. Again, native help is used. This one is separating brass knuckle joints from some tubing. This one is pulling worn copper wire from an armature. And here they're salvaging lead from a pile of useless storage batteries. The metal is melted down right here on the spot. Discarded helmets serve as molds, and when the ingots are cooled, the reclaimed metal is shipped back to the States for reuse. But that's not all that's sent back. Millions of artillery casings, too many to be melted down here, 
are gathered and sent back to ammunition factories where they're prepared for repacking and reuse. Tires, too, are sent back after they've been collected and classified and stacked in neat piles. But they're sent back only if they're in such bad shape that no amount of repair or revulcanization can make them serviceable. More than 5,000 tires are worn out every 24 hours on the Western Front. And back in the United States, this rubber will be reclaimed. Of course, some tires don't need any repair. They may have been taken off wrecked vehicles and the tires may be unharmed. In that case, they'll be reissued as new. Tubes are classified in the same manner. As soon as they're brought into their particular section, they're sorted and the seemingly good ones are tested for leaks. Pinpoint leaks might not be detected at once, so the inflated tubes are stacked, let stand for several hours, and then inspected. Over in another section is the infantry tool repair shop. Here they're repainting a flock of infantry pickmatixes by a dipping process and then hanging them out to dry. Close by is the infantry shovel repair department. This handy gadget that looks like an old-fashioned ice tong was invented by the operator to remove the useless wooden handle from the iron blade. He also got the idea of using an automobile jack as a field expedient to force the wooden handle from the steel axet. Inside the building, the stove repair section checks each unit that has been brought in from the field. Some of these have been left behind in the rain and rusted so the entire stove will need a thorough once over. The most important element here is the burner, which must be free of rust and dirt and must burn with an adjustable but steady hot flame. In a corner of the shop, gasoline lamps are stripped down, cleaned and put together, with no parts left over. And they light, as good as new. The boys in the metal repair section have worked out an assembly line routine that speeds up production. Mess kits are hammered back into shape and canteens with dents in them are blown out by compressed air. Stone molds are used too in shaping them back to their former state. Next step in the circuit is the washing. The metalware is thoroughly disinfected, first in a lye bath, then in water. Then in lye again, and finally in more water. The water counteracts the lye and leaves the metal clear of any disinfectant. The pieces are hung up in the hot sun to dry. In a different part of the metal repair section, a T5 is repairing a five gallon gas can. He gets it back into shape by using the same method as in canteen repair, air pressure. Then to test for leaks, he submerges it in water and the bubbles tell him exactly where the hole is. A piece of solder and a hot flame from an acetylene torch complete the repair job. But the job is really never done. One day of battle means many days of work for the salvage men behind the lines. Yet they know their job is the safety valve of supply, that it's vital to victory. The battlefield junk men never make the headlines. Still, with no hope of medals or decorations, they keep at it, picking up, sorting out, piling, repairing, reclaiming the debris of destruction. That's why they're happy when they get a helping hand from a wandering GI. <laughs>